important agri-food conversations uh, brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yale Lab Institute, and the Family Farms Group. Uh, my name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, including emerging topics such as soil health, plant genetics, vertical farming, and aquaculture, to name a few. This month's theme is the food and ag supply chain. And on today's call, we're joined by Mark Hockwell, uh, and COO of NanoGuard Technologies. NanoGuard's high-voltage atmospheric cold plasma technology reduces post-harvest food loss and increases food safety by pasteurizing the surface of food and feed to reduce microbial activity by greater than 99%, and cut toxin level in half. NanoGuard achieves this without post-treatment plasma residues and at a lower cost than competing technologies. This represents a sustainable solution to increase food availability and shelf life, reduce our natural resources, reduce hunger, enhance human and animal health, as well as improve profitability for farmers. Each of you knows that companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in NanoGuard's market. You are potential customers for NanoGuard's products and solutions. Uh, you have built a company similar to NanoGuard, or you are a sophisticated business person or agricultural professional who understands the market and the challenges and opportunities NanoGuard may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. And a few process comments before um, uh, we're not soliciting investment. This presentation is providing information to help NanoGuard find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. We're all on you. You can use the chat window to ask a question at any time. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Mark Hockwald, uh, COO of NanoGuard Technologies. Mark, please feel free to take it away. Thank you, David. I appreciate uh, you brokering this for us. As he mentioned, uh, NanoGuard is a, uh, a company focused on uh, improving the post-harvest supply chain, uh, bringing efficiency to it by reducing food, food waste and loss and improving food safety uh, using our patented technology, uh, which is based on cold plasma. So... Our mission and solutions are to, per, to, prevent, uh, prevent, to prevent and protect against preventable illness. So we do this by reducing um, microbes by 99% or better and by destroying mycotoxins uh, by 90% or better. And for those of you uh, who are not familiar with mycotoxins, they're secondary metabolites that are generated by certain fungi in the, in the field or in storage that are toxic to both humans and animals. And we provide a novel and sustainable solution to um, prevent uh, or actually remediate these, these items um, so that the food going out to to the uh, consumer is, is uh, safe. So, so why is this space so interesting to us? Well, food safety is, is really everyone's business. Um, what we found is that there's about 1.3 billion tons of food waste or food losses in the supply chain every year. That represents somewhere between 25 and 33% of the annual production of food. Um, there are billions of dollars being spent on new technology to improve crop production, but we think the shorter path to improving food supply and improving food safety is by putting these kind of efficiencies in the supply chain. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is that worldwide, there's about uh, 6 million people or one in 10 people who fall ill annually with, with foodborne illness. Uh, of those people, about 420,000 die per year, of which 40% are children. And 
we can address both mycotoxins and, um, and microbial contamination on food, improving the, the quality and the safety of the food in the supply chain. So our, our cold plasma solution can eradicate viruses, bacteria, fungus, and mycotoxins. And that's primarily where we're focused. And we, we can interact in the supply chain um, right as the product is being harvested all the way up to the point where the product is being uh, sold to the, to the consumer. We plug in practically anywhere along the supply chain where we can have an impact on, on reducing either microbes or mycotoxins. So how does the technology work? Well, we've dubbed our, our technology uh, aerolization. And what we do is we take a working gas, and in general, that's air, and pass it through a high voltage uh, field. Um, while that gas is passing through the field, we have electric discharge that occurs between uh, electrodes, and that electric discharge ionizes the gas stream, forming what we call reactive gas species. And these species are the ones that are acting on the microbes and the mycotoxins to, to eliminate them or to uh, passivate them. The device that we're using is uh, called a dielectric barrier discharge device. And that, elect that device regulates the flow of electrons through, through the plasma that we're generating and uh, makes it a non-thermal treatment. In other words, we, we are not treating the microbes or the mycotoxins by, by heat. We're using these reactive species to take them out. The other interesting thing with the technology is it leaves no residue on the, on the product that we've treated after, after we've treated it. And so we've been successful at reducing um, both microbes, viruses, and, and mycotoxins using this technology. So we, we're in our uh, post-series day spending phase right now. We've gotten FDA approval to use the technology on microbes, and they've agreed that it's both safe and effective to do so. We've got global patents that are covered on all four continents. We've got them uh, granted in 29 countries. Uh, we've scaled our prototype to a pilot which is installed at a Fortune 500 customer's research facility. And we validated that the pilot has scaled uh, correctly to the prototype. And we're currently working on uh, improving that pilot and actually creating what we'll call a generation two to improve its efficiency and reliability. We've been working with multiple strategic partners through research agreements to prove out the technology on their commodities. And we believe that the market that we can address has been validated at about a billion dollars uh, in the US only. Worldwide, that's probably triple that. So our current areas of focus are, are to optimize our, our plasma generator with uh, this version two to improve the longevity and the, and the long-term operability of the generator to reduce its capital cost and improve its performance in terms of speed of action on the commodities that we're treating. But we, we are working with customers now trying to match our technology with their research and with their product needs. And so we do have several sponsored research agreements that we have in place, uh, proving that the technology will either remove mycotoxins or microbials on their product. And uh, 
produce a, a better product at the end of the treatment. So this is a picture of, of our plasma generator on the left-hand side of the screen is our newest device. Um, it's uh, a very uh, small, small gap device with high intensity uh, plasma generation. Our device 1.0 uses a larger gap and generates the same sort of gases, but we feel the efficiency of the 2.0 will be higher and therefore uh, reduce our cost of generation. We're also working on a portable unit that we can take out to facilities of our customers uh, who we're working with to demonstrate the technology in their, either in their plants or their in you know in their operations and um, this is just an example of what that's going to look like it's in the process of we, we've got the design in place but we haven't we haven't built it yet we're still working on working out the logistics of building this unit so we we match up with our strategic partners sweet spots i mean our the intersection between board management and facilities operation matches up with, with ours. The board wants sustainable, sustainable operations uh, and, and the management team wants, wants profitable results and operations wants reliability and proof that we get key, key metrics from, from our treatment. And we're meeting all those um, routinely with our with our clients. So on the commercial side of the business, um, we're focused specifically in the area of food waste or food losses and food safety, uh, primarily focused on grain products and ground nuts and tree nuts. We've got 16 uh, general product customer groups identified via direct contact. We've had 65 direct customer contacts validating the technology need. We believe the total addressable market is in excess of a billion dollars. We're working with 12 of those customers through research agreements or actively negotiating with them to get to a research agreement. A research agreement would last anywhere from uh, three to three to six months and demonstrate that we can do what we say we can do on their product. We've got six customers identified for as early adopters, and we've been matching their problems with our current capabilities. And as I mentioned before, we're working on our, our device 2.0, which will allow us to address a larger segment of the market by improving the cost and performance of our plasma generator. So our revenue model is based on two arms. We, we will capture revenue uh, through royalties and annual reoccurring revenues that way. And then we'll also capture revenue through equipment sales. We'll be selling uh, plasma generators to customers who need, who need the technology and we will prov be providing uh, sale, sales of components and services after the sale to make sure those units are operating at, at their uh, peak capacity and providing us uh, uh, revenues from, from those service calls. So our team is made up of a bunch of innovators and problem solvers. Um, we're focused on, on food waste and, and improving food safety. Our board composition, uh, we have uh, both strategic and financial investors. We've got a balance of both of those on our board. Um, Within the board and within our team, uh, we are 
technology focused. Uh, we've got uh, amongst all of us participating in, in this venture, we've got people who have 21 degrees, including six with PhDs and, a, and about 239 years of diverse global experience. Uh, not just in in grain, but uh, in in other industries and in this technology area. So we're looking for people that we can work with who will be strategic partners or manufacturing partners or who will ultimately be our customers. And uh, a strategic partner would be someone who's interested and in where who's interested in working together to advance the technology and also uh, who could use the technology in their operations. A manufacturing partner would be one who'd be willing to help manufacture either the plasma generator or components for us. And then uh, customers um, don't necessarily need to be strategic partners, but that's where we would align our technology with their specific needs and solve their problems. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and hopefully uh, this will spur some questions. David, back to you. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate the fantastic presentation and it's really great to see so much progress um, on the work that NanoGuard's done and it's such an important problem space and solution that you guys are working on. Um, as, as Mark alluded to, um, if you are in the audience and you have a question, now is a great time. Um, the best way to ask the question is to type it directly into the Q&A box, and I will answer all questions in the order that they are received. Um, Q&A box better than the chat box, uh, preferably if you can navigate to that section um, to kick things off. Um, so, you know, Mark, one thing that I'm curious about, just to sort of get the questions and the conversation rolling, um, you sort of straddle this interesting um, space between, inc that includes not only food safety, but also includes um, post-harvest loss. Um, on the post-harvest loss side of things, how, how do you think about um, the way in which NanoGuard as, as a solution that's as pretty much as close to the to the grower as possible, or the, or at least an aggregator for for um, for grain, um, as opposed to some of the solutions that are sort of more on like the coding side, um, so yeah. like the real sciences of the world that are that are sort of doing stuff that might might preserve shelf life and and post harvest loss as things progress towards the store. How do you start to think about the applications of where you guys are and where these other players might come in, and where there might be crossover and where there might not be? Okay, David, the basic tenant that we're using around uh, improving, you know, food, food shelf life and security is based on r removing or pasteurizing the, the food as it comes off of the field. The closer to the field that we operate, um, the longer we believe the shelf life of that product will be. If we eliminate both the fungal and the microbial components on the food, then we feel like we'll have extended its shelf life. Now that doesn't, it won't necessarily extend the life because you know the, the products that are coming off the food are going through a, a senescence cycle. They're eventually starting to ripen and soften and you know, progress towards uh, you know, the end of their, their life cycle. But we will prevent um, destruction you know, by the unintended consequence of of mold or fungus or or bacteria on the on the product, and in that respect, we think we can increase the life of the product as it transverse through the supply chain. Uh, one question we have from the audience: um, Is this a batch process or a continuous process? And if it's batch, what is the treatment time for batch? Okay, so the answer to that is it can be both. Um, we, we've been able to successfully treat products in both batch and continuous mode. The, the treatment time depends on the commodity. It also depends on the size of the bin and on the contamination level. So um, to give you a specific answer to that, I'm not 
I'm not going to be able to for a batch process. When we look at processing times for commodities, the idea, and we're not quite there yet with the technology, but we expect to be able to treat grain, for example, at a, um, at a port as it's being loaded onto a vessel, for example, to reduce it. So, you know, the, the transit times there are probably 15 to 30 minutes of time that we have to treat it. And we think we can scale the, the technology to do that. Thanks, Mark. Um, another question from the audience. Um, I'm gonna ask part of this question. Um, is Nanogar uh, generating revenue yet? We have some revenue. Our revenue right now has been through these, uh, these, strate these testing agreements. Um, we're generating uh, somewhere between, I think last year we did about 80 or 90,000. We've done a couple hundred thousand dollars a year up to a quarter of a million. Kind of depends on, on where we are in that cycle with finishing work by these agreements. Uh, but we generally have a couple of agreements in progress at, simultaneously. We are working towards uh, a customer acquisition you know, but but the stages of doing that have been through the testing agreements, confirming that the product, you know, that we're delivering will actually work in our operation. Got it. Thanks, Mark. Um, in terms of in terms of rollout and scale, um, what's what's the the largest volume uh, that the Nanoguard has sort of treated to date, and sort of how do you start how do you start thinking about you talked a little bit about sort of the um, the modular unit versus, you know, sort of the built-in unit. Um, how do you start to think about like small scale usage versus extremely large scale usage? Okay, so our manufacturing uh, strategy is to build off of a standard size unit. We call it a module. Um, that module will be a specific size and requires specific energy, energy inputs. We're still working on what that size is going to be, but it looks like somewhere around a 30 or 40 kilowatt uh, size unit will be our, our standard module. We can link those modules together in an array to make uh, any size uh, treatment system that we need to effectively treat any quantity that we want. So if we needed 10 of those modules together, uh, we can put those together in an array and generate enough reactive gas to treat, let's say, 100 tons an hour or 200 tons an hour. Uh, a standard 30 kilowatt module might be able to treat, um, you know, it, it depends on the commodity, several several thousand or, um, you know, maybe, maybe, a thousand, maybe a thousand tons a year. Depends on the on the commodity and contamination level, um, but you know the current systems that we have as a pilot, for example, we think we can, and and the kind of products that we're focused on right now are um, are natural products that are being sold, you know, kind of in the nutraceutical space where you know you're making a hundred thousand pounds a year or 50,000 pounds a year, those products selling out to, to commerce. We have a module, you know, our unit is capable of that. And that's an eight kilowatt unit. So you can see a 30 kilowatt module will, will probably service four X, four X that right now. And, and then we can build off of that. Got it, thanks Mark. And then from a, from a business model perspective, uh, you know, I, I can imagine that there's probably customers that you're working with that are more likely to be in a position where they would want to purchase units outright, operate them themselves. There's probably some customers who might be in more of a position where they want you to run this as a service. Um, obvious advantages and disadvantages to that for you, for Nanogar as a business. Um, how are, are you guys planning on balancing that? Or are you, are you getting feedback from customers that they want to sort of go one way or the other? Um, we've had some mix of that conversation already to the extent where we've had one, one or two of the smaller customers come to us and say, we'd like you to treat our product on a, on a, on a service basis. 
you know, we'll ship it in, you do your thing to it, and we'll ship it out. We're, we're open to that model. Uh, it's not our necessarily our preferred long-term model, but um, it's one that we're considering right, you know, as, as we speak as a possible way of getting experience and being able to show this. Long-term though, you know, we are wanting to treat large, va you know, large number amount of commodities. And that means that those facilities need to be located where the commodities are. And, you know, we're not gonna be bringing those in through our, you know, in through our operation. They'll probably be out, out where the waterways are and where the storage facilities are. So we would expect those to be run by, you know, by the, you know, by the operator of the facility. Well, I'll pause here for just a moment to see if there's any final questions from the audience um, before I ask one last question and then we'll, we'll wrap things up. Okay. Well, seeing that there are none, um, Mark, how can the audience help you today? Um, and how, how can we as an audience be, be helpful to you? Okay, so um, we're, we're always looking, although this hasn't been uh, a large issue for us, um, we've had tremendous commercial pull for this kind of product. Um, uh, we've got probably more people who, who are lined up to test the, to test the, you know, the technology than we have bandwidth to be able to service them right, right now. So that's not been, that's not been a, a problem. Um, you know, we are trying to focus our technology so that, you know, on the large row commodities where, you know, the cost to treat will be, you know, commensurate with the price of the, com of the commodity. Um, so, you know, we don't think that's going to be a problem. You know, we've got, um, the, you know, our, our inputs for running the process have been air, although we have the ability to use an alternate working gas, which, you know, we would bring in and potentially recycle and electricity, which is abundantly available and inexpensive. So, that's an advantage of this technology that, you know, our cost of treat we think can be down in, uh, you know, tenths of a cent per, per kilogram range for, um, you know, for, for commodities, um, for nutraceuticals and things will charge what the market will bear and be competitive in that, in that respect. So, um, I'm not sure, I don't know what the demographics of the audience is today, but um, we think it's an interesting technology and has, has the possibility of revolutionizing the post-harvest supply, supply chain. And um, I'd just say, stay tuned. And if you are interested in the technology and want to learn more, obviously reach out to us. We'd be happy to, to talk to you and, and, and let you know what, what we think we can do for you. Excellent. Well, uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Congrats on all the progress to date. Um, I also thank the audience for your participation as well. Uh, to let everyone know, we host these calls every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time, and you can register for the AgriFood Conversations webinar series by going to agrifoodconversations.com. Uh, if you know anyone who'd like to listen to this webinar, feel free to share it with them. A replay of this webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. Um, they can also go to agrifoodconversations.com, or you can go to YouTube. Um, which we posted as well on our select like, fun page in the channel for food conversations. Otherwise, thanks everyone for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week.